Every word, every thought, every action, every ambition either comes out of love or comes out of fear. Everything is governed by, by one of those two influences. Open your Bibles to Exodus chapter 14. And uh, I love Old Testament stuff. I just, I do, I just love. I remember in Weaverville, there would be set periods of time where I would only teach out of the Old Testament. I love it so much. I, I like it, I think, because it's so, it's so obvious. You know, like David kills the Goliath, the little guy kills the big guy. Easy lesson. It's, and Daniel in the lion's den and all these stories. Uh, they're all Old Testament stories that are, are visual, very visual, story-oriented. And that helps me, helps me a lot. Uh, what we're going to read about today is uh, Israel leaving Egypt, going into the promised land. It is a prophetic picture of the people of God leaving sin and not just entering salvation, but entering the reality of the kingdom of God, the promised land. God always takes us into fulfilled purpose and fulfilled promise. That's where he takes every born again believer. Everyone who says yes, he takes them into a place of fulfilled purpose, fulfilled destiny. And uh, so that's the, the lesson that's at stake here today. We're gonna look at um, uh, the subject of fear a little bit, uh, the, what comes out of our mouth, the issue of conversation. And, uh, and let me just start by saying this. Every word, every thought, every action, every ambition either comes out of love or comes out of fear. Everything is governed by, by one of those two influences. And learning to live out of a place of love. By the way, there's, there's this crazy, careless concept of love that love just accepts and accommodates everything. It's just not true. You actually can't love well if you don't hate well. You can't love well if you don't hate well. What you hate is pretty pr important. <laughs> uh, Mike Bickle uh, says it best. He says, God's anger is always aimed at whatever interferes with love. Yeah. Yeah. There must be a hatred for sin if there's a love for God. Yeah. There must be. Not hatred of the sinner, hatred of sin. There must be that, that resolve to be and to do everything that would bring him glory. Those who see him those who behold them, him function different than everybody else. Everybody else functions out of theory, out of philosophy, but those who come to a place where they behold him live from a different, a different place. And because of that, come into places of great victory. Back to the subject here. The issue of fear is um, the command to not fear is the most frequent repeated command in the Bible, to not fear. Why? Because it it leads to unbelief. Complaining is the language of unbelief. Complaining only comes out of the heart that has a lordship challenge, a lordship issue. Where the lordship of Jesus is being compromised, complaining will be the evidence. Is there anybody else in this room? <clears throat> Don't complain, though. <laughs> so the story with M Moses and Pharaoh uh, is, uh, is very uh, easy to see. The, the participants, they each play a role that's very easy to come to a conclusion. And... Uh, it's best in these kind of moments just to simplify, read the story. So that's what we're going to do. And I'll, I'll just talk to you as we walk through it. So keep your Bibles in front of you. We've got a bunch to read. Let's start in chapter 14, Exodus. Did I tell you where? Yeah? <laughs> Five of you heard me. And... All right. <clears throat> Exodus uh, chapter 14, verse 4. Then I will harden Pharaoh's heart. If that bothers you, Repent. You know, we might as well start strong. You know. <laughs> he doesn't work for me. I work for him. 
He never owes me an explanation. What I know should never cancel out what I need to know. What I know is that every decision he makes is out of love. I may not be able to explain this, but I can see the end result. I will harden Pharaoh's heart. What you see with Pharaoh is somebody who continuously hardens his heart against the Lord. And the Lord finally says, all right, I'm going to freeze your will in that position, and I will now use your rebellion to illustrate my glory, my authority, my lordship. I will use you as a chess piece on a chessboard, and I will use you the way I want to display my glory. Some Christians sin believing that they will just be able to repent afterwards. Repentance is a gift. You can't depend on a gift. <laughs> You're giving me that confused look. That uh, I'm not saying he won't forgive you. I'm just saying, don't be stupid. Don't be careless with your life. Don't do stupid things just assuming that you, that you will have God attending to every need. It's not the way it works. In the kingdom, there's a king. And that king is Lord over all. All right, that, uh, that went over pretty well. Let's see if we can get a little farther this time. Then I will harden Pharaoh's heart so that he will pursue them. And I will gain honor over Pharaoh and over all his army that the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord. Some of you are facing problems in your life right now because the Lord wants to demonstrate his lordship to your enemies, to those who oppose you, to those who are causing you heartache. It's not about you. Sometimes we have to just get over ourselves. It's not always about us. Sometimes there's a bigger picture. And in the bigger picture, God is wanting to display who he is because it is a need maybe in an entire family line, maybe an entire neighborhood or a city or a place of business. God is wanting to demonstrate his lordship over the situations that you're facing. Amen. Amen. All right, verse 10. When Pharaoh drew near, the children of Israel lifted their eyes and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. So they were very afraid and the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. So here's what we've got going on. Israel is leaving Egypt and Pharaoh and his army is coming after him. And so they turn around in their journey and they see Egypt coming after them. And it says, they are very afraid. The wrong kind of fear will drive you away from the Lordship of Jesus. The right kind of fear endears you to him. <clears throat> Complaining is the language of fear. It's the language of unbelief. Nobody complains who sees God's role in the middle of their situation. The complaint only happens because we've lost sight of who he is and where he is. There are some fears that are natural fears or can I say responsible fears? Putting your hand on a hot stove. Don't tempt God, that's stupid. <laughs> Walking across the floor barefoot with broken glass. It's not a smart idea voting for socialism. It's just not. <laughs> so I want to make sure you were awake. <laughs> I've been waiting all morning to say that. Actually longer than that. Verse 13, Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. <laughs> I'm sorry, this, I don't have enough time to take many detours, so I'll just take one and then this is the last one. I read this post that said, when you have a conflict with your wife, just tell her she's overreacting and that'll calm everything down. That's kind of what I thought of here. Moses comes to Israel, who was terrified, said, don't be afraid. 
Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. There's a good idea. I just won't be afraid. But then he comes with the word of the Lord. Don't be afraid. And he says, do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see again no more forever. I had this hit me strong in the Twin View service just a few minutes ago. And I feel the same here now. There are some of you that are facing ongoing problems. And I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm supposed to declare over you you will never see those Egyptians. In that issue, you'll never see them again. Today it ends. That will not be a cyclical issue in your life. It ends today. But here's the word that Moses brought to the nation of Israel. The Egyptians, though, were trying to kill you. You will never see them again forever. Okay, move on. It says, um, verse 14, the Lord will fight for you and you shall hold your peace. Now, verse 15 is important. And the Lord said to Moses, why do you cry out to me? All right, what's happening here? Verse 13 and 14, Moses is prophesying. Just stand still. God's gonna deliver you. You're gonna see him work on your behalf. He's gonna bring you to a place of great peace. Just hold your place. And the very next verse we see, God says, why are you crying out to me? So that tells me after the prophecy, Moses is interceding. He gave this great word to Israel and then he's saying, oh God, oh God, oh God, oh God. Oh God. Do you see these people that I'm leading? Oh God. So the Lord says, why do you cry out to me? So apparently there was prayer after the prophecy. But what does he say? Verse 15, the Lord said to Moses, why do you cry out to me? Tell the children of Israel to go forward. Now, I don't know if you notice this, but there's a big difference between standing still and going forward. <laughs> Moses sensed the safety and the provision of the Lord. And let me say, it's possible he assumed he's gonna do it while we stand still. And the Lord brought one clarification to that prophetic word. I'm going to do it, but I'm gonna do it while you're moving forward. You're not to stand still. And there are some times, honestly, where you just take the position of rest and there are other times you just move in the right direction. God is not, usually he's not looking for great courageous leaps in movement. He's generally looking for just movement in the right direction. We had a staff member here years ago that had a very, very serious uh, head trauma injury, very serious. And he couldn't play with his children anymore. He couldn't be in the room where there was any kind of, uh, not even argument, just challenging conversation. There's certain things he couldn't see on TV because he was so traumatized in the injury of his head. And uh, he was actually, he was over there in one Sunday night service, was in the men's room, the restroom, and the Lord just prompted him, bump your head against the wall. That terrified him because that would just send him to, to, to just to bump his head against the wall. And he said, Lord, I can't do that. And then what he did, as he just leaned his head softly against the wall, instantly healed. Completely healed of all the trauma for so long because the Lord isn't looking always for great courageous leaps. He's looking for movement in the right direction. Does that make sense? Stop trying to be a hero. Just move in the right direction. Just move in the right direction. So he says, why do you cry out to me? Tell the children of Israel to go forward. We move on down through this story and the Lord begins to reveal himself as being with the children of Israel in this journey. This is, I, I, I like the story. I like the story a lot. It says in verse 19, excuse me, verse 18, the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I have gained honor for myself over Pharaoh, his chariots and his horsemen. And the angel of God who went before the camp of Israel moved and went behind them. This is interesting. So God's in front of them, showing them where to go, and he's behind them, protecting them from, from the Egyptians, yeah. right? So the angel of God who went before the camp moved and went behind them, and the pillar of the cloud went before them and stood behind them. <laughs> so he went between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel, Thus it was a cloud of darkness to the one and it gave light by night to the other. Two manifestations of the same revival. 
a cloud in one case, fire in another. The same sun that melts the ice hardens the clay. The workings and dealings of God, the effect of those workings and dealings have everything in the world to do with our heart's condition. The posture, the position of our heart. Am I saying, God, prove it to me? Or am I saying, no matter what you say, my answer is yes. Because those two positions are extremely different. It's not a heaven or hell issue. It's, a, it's an issue of what measure of promised land will I actually experience in my lifetime. And we were all born to enter the reality of the fulfilled promises of God over our lives and our family line until it actually brings transformation to culture itself. Let's move on. I want you to go with me to chapter 15 and we'll jump down to verse 22. How many of you have your Bibles? Let me see them. See, see your Bibles? All right. There we go. I like it. I like it. And by the way, all of our online family, I love you guys so much. I, I just love, I, I miss seeing you different places around the world where you come up and, uh, and say hi. So I miss you. All right, verse 22. Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea. They went out into the wilderness of Shur. They went three days into the wilderness, found no water. When they came to Mara, they could not drink the water, uh, the waters of Mara, because it was bitter. Therefore, they called the name Mara. And the people complained against Moses. Here's the thing about complaining. Complaining is always reasonable. Almost always there's a good reason for it. All you have to do is just remove the promises and presence of God out of the equation to be legalized in your complaining. See, fear is a weird thing too because fear will always attract whatever information is needed to legitimize its existence. And complaining functions out of that spirit of fear. They were in need of water. Is that a sin? No. <laughs> and the people complained against Moses. That's logical. Chapter 16. Verse two, the whole congregation of the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. Verse three is rather humorous to me. The children of Israel said to them, oh, that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the pots of meat, when we ate bread to the full, for you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. <laughs> Then the Lord said to Moses, behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you and the people shall go out and gather a certain quota every day that I may test them. What's going on here? God has just tested them with lack and now they're gonna be tested with abundance. If you don't trust God with lack, you'll never trust him with abundance. Here in this moment, they are complaining against Moses and they're saying, oh, that we would have died in Egypt when the pots were full of meat and we had all the bread we could eat. I don't know what's happened to their memory because days earlier, they were complaining about their conditions. But what complaining does, complaining distorts your view of reality. It distorts your view of reality. Perspective is lost in complaining because we move uh, in, in the momentum of unbelief. We move into a way that cancels out the God-given ability to simply just trust God, just to trust him no matter what. Complaining cancels out the awareness of reality. It actually, it actually clouds the vision on the experiences of our life, the situations of our life. And in this case, they're saying it would have been better for us to die when we were in the lap of luxury. <laughs> they were slaves. Listen carefully. It's a breakdown of character of the heart to choose the safety of slavery over the responsibility of freedom. What's happening in this generation right now is not the first time it's happened. 
It happened to Israel right here, and they were preferring the safety of slavery over the responsibility of freedom. All right, that went over well. Let's just uh, keep on moving here. Verse seven says, and in the morning you will see the glory of the Lord for he hears your complaints against the Lord. Interesting. Seeing the glory is usually thought of as a reward, but it's not in this case. It's the opportunity to recalibrate values. I, I don't know if, if that makes sense to you. Let me, let me try to say it this way. Beholding him gives me the opportunity to readjust all my values, what I'm thinking, what are my priorities, the focus of my life. The glory recalibrates everything. Without that, I live randomly, carelessly as to whatever I think is the best. And so he says, I've heard their complaints. I'm gonna show them my glory. Why? Because in that experience, they will have opportunity to reset the values of their heart. Chapter 17, verse two. <clears throat> Therefore Moses, excuse me, the people contended with Moses saying, give us water that we may drink. Moses responded to them, why do you contend with me? Why do you tempt the Lord? <laughs> All right. Let's just say we're part of the two million people that are following this guy named Moses. We've been walking for days. We have no water. The desire for water is right. The complaint against Moses is not. Why? Biblically, it's called tempting God. What is it to tempt God? It's to appeal to him to do evil. Now, he can't but it's still the wrong posture for a person to take. In Psalm 78, which is a psalm that really gives overview of this whole situation, Psalm 78, he says, you tempt the Lord by limiting the Holy One of Israel. You tempt the Lord. You tempt him by putting a cap on his capability and the, the profound impact of his covenant with you. <laughs> You tempt him by limiting. Now, first of all, he doesn't expect me to fully imagine all he's capable of. I don't have, I don't have the mental capacity. He's not looking for that. He's looking for the, the baby steps, the steps in the right direction that just removes, removes the limit of what God is capable and willing to do in my lifetime. What we see of him... Um, what he shows us about his nature is supposed to be the thing we hold to in difficulty. I'm not saying that right. The absolute uh, anchor of our soul is what he has shown us about his nature and his covenant. If I let go of that to embrace a fear, an accusation, a resentment, any of those kinds of things, I'm letting go of the most solid thing in my life. Why? You and I were designed for one primary purpose. This will sound strange to you, but one primary purpose, and that was to worship. Yeah. Worship is the recognition of worth. In other words, God unveils his nature, his presence to a people. The only logical response is worship. He's not looking for a good worship service. I mean, those are wonderful, but that's, that's not the point. In John 4, it says, the Father looks for worshipers, those who would worship in spirit and truth. It doesn't say he's looking for worship. He's not an egotist in need of our affirmation. He doesn't need us to boost his ego. He's looking for worship. Why? Because he's a God of love. And the God of love always wants the best for us. And since you become like whatever you worship, he could want nothing better for us than for us to worship him. Because in that transforming presence, we are transformed. Wow. Good. All right, let's come to the end of this. It says, uh, verse seven, 
So he called the name of the place Massa and Meribah because the contention of the children of Israel and because they tempted the Lord saying, is the Lord among us or not? They tempted the Lord saying, is the Lord among us? Okay, review the context here. Pillar of fire at night, a cloud by day. And they're asking the question, is the Lord among us? That's what complaining does. It distorts your view of what's already established in your life. It's, it's like, I don't know if you, how many of you have ever had like a dislocated joint. I used to have this knee occasionally go out of joint from football in high school. And I remember one time, in fact, uh, in Weaverville, Chris was around when, it, when it, uh, I got up out of the chair or something and, and it dislocated. My, the lower part of my leg is still connected. It's still alive. There's a measure of mobility, very limited, but a measure. It's still me. It's still mine. But I couldn't stand on it for all the money in the world. I couldn't stand on it because it's actually out of joint. And what happens with complaining is it dislocates you from your design. It dislocates you. You're alive, but the goal has changed from the promised land to survival. So they tempted the Lord by saying, is the Lord among us? At one time, I, I didn't write the reference down. I should have, but I, I, I forgot to look at it. Or I, I didn't get the verse for you. But at one point, the Lord spoke to Israel and he said, my face was in the cloud. So here we are. We're following this cloud around the wilderness. Uh, it's important to follow the cloud because it's a desolate place. But wherever he goes, there's heating at night. There's cooling during the day. And there's this bread that appears. So it's a, it's a good thing. You want to follow him. Your clothes don't wear out, you know. Follow the cloud. <clears throat> so they learned to follow this cloud. We're actually designed by God to recognize presence. And the Lord told Israel, my face was in the cloud, but I didn't let you see any form because I knew you to be an idolatrous people who would create an image after the form that you saw. So sometimes when the Lord withholds clarity, it's his mercy because he knows our bent to create formula, yeah. wow. idols, ideologies, where he's no longer the moment by moment inspiration for what we're doing. So they tempted the Lord saying, is the Lord among us? There's this uh, verse in, in Proverbs. Um, let, me, let me read it to you. I've been thinking about it a bit. It says, a man will be satisfied with good by the fruit of his mouth. A man will be satisfied with good by the fruit of his mouth. I don't know. I, I've, I have felt for a while this verse has been kind of impacted me a bit. A man will be satisfied with good by the fruit of his mouth. You understand that it's a small key that opens a big door. And every once in a while, we find these phrases that might be easy to overlook when in fact, they are connected to so much of the reality of God in our life. Yeah. If we can just simply capture the power of that simple key. Wow. A man will be satisfied with good. Emotionally, Socially, intellectually, spiritually, nourished, full, abundantly, and is determined by what first came out of the person's mouth. 
In other words, the measure for what I received, at least in this context, is set by what first comes out of my mouth. First, by what comes out of my mouth. So life and death is in the power of the tongue. Some things have to be said. This has been a part of our, our culture for as long as I can remember. But I still feel like I need, I need to review this one. Here's the deal. Psalms 91. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge. He is my strength. He is my God in whom I will trust. It says, I will say of the Lord. It doesn't say, and I will think of the Lord. It doesn't say, I will contemplate of the Lord. It says, I will say, because some things just need to be said. Some things need to be said. I have found for me, it's a strength for me. When I'm in a a rough place, in fact, Benny and I will sit together on the couch, we'll pray together, and we will make this statement. We trust you, Father. You are our refuge. You are our strength. You're our hiding place. We trust you. We trust you. And make the decree. Make the proclamation. Don't, don't, don't let it be passive. Yes. Don't let it be just yeah. some passive yeah. comment of agreement. It's, it's no. Apparently, things come into my life by what comes out of my mouth. Yes. And so I am going to make a decree. I will say of the Lord, and I am in fact saying it now, The Lord is my refuge. He is my hiding place. He is my dwelling place. And in him, I will trust. I will trust. I don't have a plan B. There's no other options. I serve one God. No options. The scripture actually teaches that what comes into our life comes through a measurement set by your decrees. The scripture says he inhabits the praises of his people. His amen to my recognition of who he is, putting it in word form as he comes and he establishes his throne upon the praises of his people. If God occupies my praise, who occupies my complaints? Words are covenants. Words are partnerships. They're agreements. You survived. You survived the entire message. Congratulations. Why don't you stand? I like to lead in prayer when I'm through speaking, but I, I kind of feel like you ought to pray on your own and just basically say, whatever he said. <laughs> amen. Whatever that was, amen. I don't, I don't know what just happened, but that's, that's what I want happening right here in me. I want, I want the language of the kingdom to be my language. The language of the kingdom. I I say of the Lord. Why don't we do this together? I will say of the Lord. Say that with me. He is my refuge. My fortress. fortress. In him will I trust. trust. Wow. Say it again. I will say of the Lord. Lord. He is my refuge. My My fortress. fortress. My God. God. In him will I trust. trust. That is our confession to you, Father. That's our confession to you. We, we just acknowledge our trust is in you. Our trust is in you. Anytime we come together in a crowd this size, there's always a, 
a high chance that we have people here that don't have a personal relationship with Jesus. You don't know what it is to be, the Bible calls, born again. It's where there's that place of absolute surrender to be a follower, a disciple of Jesus, turning from your life to honestly embracing his. Look what it's like to follow him. And if there's anybody here that's in that place that would just say to me, Bill, I don't want to leave the building. I don't want to leave the property until I know that I've been forgiven of sin and I truly have been brought into the family of God. If that's you, put a hand up real quick right where you are. I want to make sure that, that, uh, that we take advantage of this moment for your sake. As far as I'm concerned, this entire day could be just for this one yes, moment to right. give you a chance to come to know the love of God. Anybody at all, real quickly. Those who are online, we, all, we have no, great numbers of people that respond online as well. I want to encourage you, just write in the chat box. We have pastors there that will talk with you and pray with you. All right, well, I'm going to assume you're all in. Let's have, who's, who's help, helping me out? Leslie, come on up. Let's, uh, everybody, keep your places if you would, but let's have ministry team come to the front to help us with this next part.